Hey folks, today's episode is brought to you by CarParts.com. CarParts.com is the smarter way to shop for auto parts. Their fast, mobile-friendly experience makes it easy to shop for the parts you need when you need them. Just enter the year, make, and model of your vehicle, start shopping, and start saving. It's that simple. Uh, yeah, you ever live with no cup holder for three years and you realize you don't need a garage door in the center of your car? That was me. That was me. And so car parts. I'd like a cup holder. My Ferrari 328 has no cup holder. I can't bring I can't bring my coffee with me. Yeah, it's annoying, right? You got to yes. hold it between your legs or yeah. something, which just feels very risky. Yes. So thankfully, they had a cup holder. It fit perfectly, and also like power steering lines, some other parts, tail lights, basically freshened the whole car up, made it more usable, more visible, and uh, made me much happier as an owner. Brilliant. Carparts.com stocks their own inventory, cutting out the middleman and passing the savings on to you. Whether you've been in a collision, working on your project car or need to catch up on maintenance, visit carparts.com slash the smoking tire for 10% off $100 or more on select brands. Get the right parts right now at carparts.com. The Smoking Tire Podcast is brought to you today by HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. The best thing about HelloFresh for me is that if you like to cook already, Getting the the sort of like food delivery things seems like kind of a cop out, but HelloFresh isn't because they're sending you uh, recipes and fresh ingredients and you still do the cooking. It's not like uh, those other meal services where you re- just reheat something that's already been made and it feels like eating leftovers every day. That sucks. HelloFresh, you're doing the cooking, but they just take the, uh, the the parts out of it that suck, like going to the grocery store, like buying more than you need in order to make a recipe, like trying to figure out which recipe in your big wall of recipe books or on the internet to make. Like, for instance, here at Westside Collector Car Storage, people want to drive their cars, and we store them, we wash them, we check their tire pressures, and we help maintain them. So we do all the annoying things so people can actually go out and drive their cars. That's like HelloFresh. HelloFresh does all the annoying things, sending the fresh ingredients pre-portioned to you along with an easy-to-read recipe card that you can customize so you know what you're getting, right? You can change your delivery day, change your food preference, change your plant size, and then you do the cooking. So you you get to you be involved in the process, you get to learn new recipes, you get a sense of accomplishment, and you know you're eating a totally fresh uh, dinner. It's excellent. Every HelloFresh meal I've cooked, um, they say on the sheet, around 30 minutes or less. I found, including total prep time, it's like I would lock it in under 40. Around 30 minutes or less, some of them definitely under 40. Uh, it's quick and easy meals. You've got some 20-minute recipes. You've got some more gourmet options. You've got uh, various diet restriction ones, whether it's vegetarian or, uh, or whatnot. HelloFresh is 72% cheaper than a restaurant meal of the same quality. That I definitely believe. You could save over $65 a month uh, ordering HelloFresh instead of grocery shopping. That's definitely true. 50 menu and market items every week, um, including some healthy options, some family-friendly options, some veggie options, and gourmet. Gourmet means throw your health out the window. Uh, It's going to be delicious. That's what that means. (laughs) And So uh, I love HelloFresh because it just makes uh, cooking more fun. I keep those recipe cards for later if I ever want to revisit something and make it again. And you can, too. Go to HelloFresh.com slash SmokingTire16, the number 16, SmokingTire16, and use code SmokingTire16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. So HelloFresh.com slash SmokingTire16. Use code SmokingTire16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. We're also brought to you today by Policy Genius. It is an interesting world out there, folks. Things can happen. You never know when they're going to happen, and you want to be prepared. And trust me, you don't want to think about insurance 
once you already need insurance. I've had more people talk to me about how they wish they had certain types of insurance after the disaster already happened. You need to get on this game beforehand, and Policy Genius can easily help you find home and auto coverage similar to what you have now, but at a lower price. If your home and auto policies are almost up for renewal, let Policy Genius look for a lower rate for you by comparing top insurers from Progressive to Allstate. It's your one stop shop to find and buy the insurance you need. So head over to policygenius.com and answer a few questions. Policy Genius will show you price estimates for policies that fit your search and help you understand your options. The Policy Genius team can look for ways to try to save you more money, and if they find a better rate than what you're paying right now, they will switch you over for free. Customers who bundled their home and auto policies with Policy Genius saved an average of $1,250 a year versus what they were paying before. The Policy Genius team works for you, not the insurance companies, so you can trust them to offer unbiased help and advocate for you at every step until you're covered. Policy Genius doesn't add any extra fees. They won't sell your info to third parties, and their top so- top notch service has earned them thousands of five star reviews across Google and Trustpilot. Since 2014, Policy Genius has helped over 30 million people shop for insurance and placed 120 billion in coverage. So head over to policygenius.com, get your free home and auto insurance quotes, and see how much you could save. Policy Genius dot com baby last but certainly not we, not least off the record is here they are here for you people off the record.com slash tst or code tst 10 on the off the record app friends don't let friends plead guilty folks the the uh uh ticket writing industrial complex is very real It's not to say there aren't horrible reckless drivers out there that deserve to have their licenses taken away there are But odds are you aren't one of them. You just got caught up in the system. And it is important to not let the system run you over. Because if you get a ticket, it's not just about that one ticket. It's about your insurance rates. It's about about you being in that system for much, much longer than that one fine. And your insurance premium could increase multiples of what the actual moving violation amount is on the ticket. So before you plead guilty... Get to offtherecord.com slash TST and see if one of their expert crack lawyers can help you get those points off your record. They have an extremely high success rate. I've used Off the Record personally twice, and I have never heard from the state again. Boom! Tickets gone. Vanished into the ether. And... Um, You can too. Either download the Off The Record app and use code TST10 on the Off The Record app or go to offtherecord.com slash TST. Make yourself an account like like we just talked about with insurance. You don't want to need this once it's too late. Okay, have it ready. And that way, if you get pulled over for something, you're not panicking. It's not going to be the end of the world. You just... Just sign that thing uh, that the cop gives you and then immediately go straight to off the record and they will help get those points off your record. If they don't get the points off your record, if they don't meaningfully reduce that ticket to something that doesn't really affect your life in the long term, they have a money back guarantee. There's some fine print, but you can read all about it at offtherecord.com slash TST. All right, folks, on today's show, very, very interesting show uh, with my new friend, Riley Brennan. Riley was introduced to me by uh, Alex Roy. Uh, He is an expert in uh, autonomy, in macro mobility and micro mobility, meaning um, urbanist uh, solutions, transportation solutions. He has studied um, everything from bird scooters to ocean liners to shipping vessels to autonomous buses. Uh, he's part of a, a VC company that invent, uh, invests in uh, early stage mobility solutions, and he's had some successes, some failures. We talk about that, and we talk about uh, what the future of uh, potentially green transportation could look like. I really enjoyed this conversation. It was so interesting, and I hope you guys too. Uh, Riley Brennan on the Smoking Tire Podcast. 
No, thanks for thanks for coming down. I really yeah, thanks, I appreciate man. it. Yeah. As soon as as soon yeah. as Alex was like, "This is the person you need to mm-hmm. be talking to," mm-hmm. I usually take his word for it on yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, and uh, I started following you on Twitter and, and reading some of your stuff, and mm-hmm. and I find it to be really interesting. And, and we've gotten so many like questions recently from fans and stuff about just like the you know inevitability of right. of. Uh, autonomous vehicles Mm -hmm. and um and i really feel like the 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 at least the for the very beginning of it is going to be all in the commercial sector probably versus privately owned right probably yeah i mean i'm of the belief that we'll never actually have level five vehicles at all ever really uh and because only humans are dumb enough to think they can drive at any position at any time of day you know like only your 17 year old nephew wants to go on I-94, you know, in the middle of a snowstorm at any time of day. Uh-huh. A machine is fundamentally smart, hopefully smarter than that. Oh, that's, well, that's right. interesting. So that really means level four when you put so the, on So the, the, you think that, that because there are situations where the machine will say no. Exactly. I've always kind of, that, that, that the ability of the machine to say no, mm-hmm. or the potential of the machine to say no, has always been kind of worrisome to me because right. I'm definitely not like I'm a progressive. I'm not a libertarian or anything like that. But no. I've always kind of felt like the worrying thing about the potential for privately owned AVs, right. where in some future where there's no steering wheel at all, right. where the car is literally, "Hey, car, take me to." Mm-hmm. Domino's Pizza or whatever, right. yeah. and the car goes for for a reason unrelated to mm-hmm. weather, political situation, yeah. where the car just goes. No, no, we're not doing that. Today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is, is that scary stuff, that is, or is that that's kind of frightening to me? But I just mean conditionally, machines saying the weather, the road you're going to, are going on, and all these other factors. We're not. We can't do that trip. Mm. My limitations are. You know, so, do, have do you think met. that would be a uh, the machine saying? I'm not able to do that? Or is it like the machine has common sense? Like Tahoe, you know, a month ago, the police and everyone said, do not go driving. Sure. And then people went driving and right. then the cops had to put out a bolt and that was like, great. This all is hey, assholes, we this told you. I mean, were, so right. are you speaking, it's like the car goes, no, it's not safe, Dave? Correct. Okay. Exactly. Wow. And so that's why, you know, do you remember when Lyft started an engineering group called Level 5? Uh, I don't know if you remember this, but they had, an, don't, a, they no. had an AV group within Lyft. I remember, I remember the Uber one, obviously, yeah. which Uber ended one, pretty disastrously. Right. And the Lyft one was actually bought by uh, Woven, part of Toyota recently. Mm-hmm. But it was called Level 5. And I remember talking to somebody saying, do you really want to call Level 5? And I gave them this, like, 20-second explanation of why that was a bad idea. And they are like, shit, we've already printed the business card. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, but even Level 4 is hard. Like, just because we're saying Level 5, in my view, won't exist. Level 4 is still, we're talking about billions of dollars and a lot of time to get to that point, where you can reliably call it like an Uber is what you want. Yeah. You know, and that's pretty far away. Like... On a much more baseline level, how do we think we c- – like, my problem is that that they always talk about improving safety. It's always that, – that, that's the, the, the right. crutch they like to lean on is we're going to yeah. improve safety. Road deaths are unacceptable. Car accidents are sure. unacceptable. And they always talk about this hypothetical average human driver, sure. safer than the average human. Right. They never talk about an optimal human. Right. They never That's talk right. about let's let's benchmark this against the the five or ten percent of our best drivers, right. not this average. Right. And do you think that? I mean, do you think that it's reasonable to think to believe that that we can? actually do this to improve safety as opposed to just having a fun toy? It's a great question. Um, I'm a big believer in ADAS getting a lot better and being in supportive of us, almost the- A parallel autonomy. Yeah, the yes. feeling of, you know, to some extent, like the Gran Turismo ghost car, mm-hmm. you know, like that, the idea of something that's machine-based that's making you better as a human um, or saving you perhaps from some incident that you were you know, beyond your capabilities. But so you're talking about an uncrashable car, not w- a car that you take a nap and it takes you somewhere. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And that, you know, Alex Roy has come up with this kind of, you know, binary of 
uh, I think he calls it Roy's Razor, which is can his mother sleep in the back seat? Then it's an autonomous car. And if you can't, if she can't do that, then I don't know if it's mother or somebody. I like his some uh, his elevator Roy's versus Roy's. escalator yeah, argument, right, right. which is uh, ADAS yeah. is the escalator yeah. and autonomy is the elevator. I think that's right. Yeah. And so I, I'm not really a big um, – I'm a big believer in the eventual, like level four autonomy and the benefits from that, both in terms of passenger vehicle and as well as commercial. But the here and now, in the next five years, ten years, I'm not a big believer in those systems actually being at scale. I think they're going to be in very limited situations, like you've seen them in San Francisco or in little you know areas, commercial side and particularly off road. So if you go into like what our fund calls structured autonomy, so. Um, if you're doing ag and mining and construction, mm. you can deploy that stuff now, and right. there are companies doing that. So I've seen farming as well. Farming's like, big. Yeah. There's obvious reasons where you could for, program, you know, yeah. your field. Sure. Right. And then you just, you know, have a have like, a coffee and watch some monitors it, while your thing exactly. is, is out there. Yeah. yeah. And so there, there's there's versions of that which are not only perfectly acceptable, but also those are really large markets. Yeah. So what we do, you know, we invest in early stage startups when they're really early. Like we like to say we're, they're either early or way too early. <laughs> when they yeah. us, right? So we get a lot of stuff wrong, but when we get it right, um, they tend to be in these really big markets where they're affecting some sort of change. And so we had a agriculture company that was bought by John Deere last summer. And you know, Deere is gonna eventually have a way to sell that to their customers. And um, those kind of, you know, if you go through all those big industrial categories, whether it's shipping or mining or ag, there will be an autonomy solution for all those things. Sure. And so the unsexy, perhaps. Um, it seems the, like the, the risk is much lower, too. Well, I mean, you're, you're not carrying passengers, you're not on public roads. Yeah. Not only that, but you don't have a passenger who needs to get there in seven minutes as opposed to eight minutes. Right. Whereas with parcels and with these other things, you can just stop and yeah. restart and keep going. Yeah. So the the... I mean, really, when you think about it, the AV um, focus from the media started in 2016, which is when Cruise was bought by GM, and a ton of people came into the space, some for good reasons, some perhaps just mercenaries who wanted to also sell a company to a big company for a billion dollars. Um, but that's a good thing, though, because we sometimes you need those like big events to bring smart people in, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then some great companies are developed. So. We still believe in a lot of passenger carrying robotics and safety stuff. But to, to your earlier point about a lot of people put up this veil of safety and they believe, oh, if I just kind of couch everything in my safety bias, and I've always been a big safety proponent, it will make my commercial interests kind of feel more authentic. Right. And um, that's I think it's maybe, even shallower than that. I feel like when I talk to people who own Teslas mm -hmm. and who have autopilot. Right. And I explained to them that the system is not particularly safe. And yeah. here's here's why. Or it's not safer than sure. what all the other L, uh, L2 systems are doing. And yeah. the fact that some people with no training and no ins commercial insurance coverage and no right. engineering background can use this city streets thing when we've seen videos of it sure. behaving horribly yeah. that it's – it's not ethically right to say that you're going to improve safety by doing this very dangerous thing first. And they and they I I kind of whittle them down and eventually it comes down to but I like it it's fun. Yeah. Don't take my toy away. Yeah, I think <laughs> what's interesting is people who own Teslas who can detach themselves from the kind of religious zeal of all the things that encapsulate being a Tesla owner. And, you know, we have, I have friends on both sides of that, right? Some people who, um, almost like if you accept one part of it, you then have to espouse all the other parts of it. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the interesting parts. In fact, why I uh, really started to become friends with Alex Roy, because I originally, I think I told you this, like when I first saw pictures of Alex Roy in like white suits and <laughs> yeah, scarves yeah. and stuff, I was like, this just doesn't seem like somebody I'm going to be friends with. And then I started reading his coverage of Tesla and ADAS and a bunch of stuff. And I think the really good answer to a lot of the Tesla uh, technology is there's probably a lot of great stuff there that eventually will have huge benefits for individual Tesla consumers and other people. But the question mark around you know public road testing and the way that 
from my point of view, the language that Tesla uses is really um, out of line with what the vehicle can do. Yeah. So I actually, I think that a lot of the technology development is great. Um, and if they'd call it something different, it would have a much different message for the consumer. If it was called, you know, we help you drive, not autopilot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you yeah. still have to drive or something like that. Yeah. But calling it autopilot and full self-driving, to me, um, creates this idea around technology that makes people believe that the car is actually autonomous. And there was that AAA study last year that I think they pulled Tesla owners and a bunch of other people, and they basically said, do you think this means the car's autonomous? And so many people, I can't remember what the percentage was, but I can send it to you after the show, um, believe that the car's autonomous because of the labeling. Yeah. Right? And so we have to get better at those companies. Marketing have to get, works, as it turns out. As it turns as out, marketing <laughs> works, right? <laughs> Shocking, yeah. I know, right. but marketing does work. Yeah. And so the, the interesting thing is in the U.S., if we were to um, – do food. So if we were to make a yogurt yeah. and we wanted to sell organic yogurt, you know, the USDA has these very specific rules around mm. food labeling, like chorizo and, you know, arroz con pollo and stuff like that have to have like 18% chicken meat in it and like very, very specific. Yeah. But you get in a DOT and it's a, and you can have situations like this where you can just call it whatever you want. You might as well just call it it's full self-driving. Yeah. Do, and are there any rules around what that means? No. So it's just so funny because if you think about it, like if you and I eat yogurt we shouldn't eat, we might theoretically get sick. Yeah. But if you drive, a, if you think your car's autonomous mm-hmm. and it's not, what about all the non-consenting victims around the vehicle that have not bought into that idea? I ride motorcycles around LA in the city with yeah. chock full of Teslas. Sure, of course. And every single, not, I mean... Every single day, I see someone just down here on their phone sure. and not up here, you right. know? And so... Now, the it, argument against for the other vehicles or for Tesla owners would be, well, think about the people who are doing that in uh, vehicles that don't have autopilot. Yeah. Well, right? there's laws, ag- there's laws <laughs> there against, laws against, it, against and, it, right? And, right. And, and if you choose to break that law, there's a, there's a yeah. punishment for it, sure. but you're at least not misguided enough right, to right. think that right. the car is going to do That's true. the right thing. That's true. I, and I'd be curious what the percentage is of Tesla owners who do hands off the wheel, doing a different activity versus other cars. Like, there's no way to study this, but I wonder if that knowing the technology's there gives the drivers a comfort level and they go, well, I can get away with it here because it's safe because the car is driving itself. Maybe. I mean, I like in all these arguments, I like to, you've heard of like straw manning, right? So just making somebody else's argument weaker by just picking the the sort of the The little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So if you steel man it and just make it, try to make the argument the strongest, um, but still knock it down is Mm. kind of my favorite way to look at some of the stuff. And I think the steel man argument for Tesla is that there's so much development that needs to be done because the way that humans interact with their devices inside vehicles today and driving has become really boring for other than the people who keep their cars here and go out in the canyon. For sure. Most driving is really monotonous and is an appliance type of experience. And those people are increasingly, since the invention of the iPhone, just looking at their devices and they're not really driving. And so the way that we mediate and help humans to figure out either to get more engaged with the car, which I don't think is really going to happen all that much. No, it's, that's, um, yeah, we're not going back to air-cooled Porsches. You right. Know? It's, well, unfortunately. I, I think that would only matter to a certain percentage of the yeah. audience. Yeah. You know? yeah. Unless you went back to the 30s where you had to have both hands on the wheel, Spark you're going to die. Right. <laughs> right. They, you know, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, the other, I mean, the other interesting thing, which I think you guys have mentioned on the show, is that FSD is currently so fraught with problems that it's actually one of the most engaging driving yeah. experiences <laughs> yeah. because the, you have to yeah, the engage right. with it. It's only safe because it's so horrible. You have, you to, have like, to be on really, yeah. the chip. Right. That's it's why the uh, where autopilot versus FSD, yes. the, the really bad accidents are happening with autopilot right. because it's just good enough exactly. to, to make you, you into zone that, out into and that, in that comfort. Yeah. Right. When the system is truly terrible, you're right. like, no, I got to yeah, pay attention exactly. to this. Yeah. <laughs> so I, so I, I mean, the Tesla argument around AV, I think is fascinating, but I also think the Tesla's value to what the industry is today around electric vehicles, you could not be where we are today without Tesla just doing sure. EVs. Mm-hmm. Now, if Tesla was just I just, just wonder how long company, the tail is on. That that statement that, okay, you couldn't be there without Tesla. Right. How long a tail do they get on that? Probably 20 years. Okay. Probably 20 so you, years. So, we could, so, in, when, so they, they came out in 08. The Model yeah. S came out in 2012. So in 2032, we can shut the fuck up about how we couldn't be. I think be. that's probably right. All right. Yeah, I think that. But the interesting thing is, like, I remember back, way back in the day, <laughs> I used to work 
uh, in car magazines. So like your Tony Caroga gave me a list of things to talk to you okay. about. Yeah, yeah. I back when print magazines actually make money, I worked at Automobile Magazine, which was owned at the time by Prime Media. I don't know if you ever heard of any of these companies, yeah, but of course. Um, old school media companies. And um, there was a GM exec that came in one day and we were talking about electric vehicles and he said the only people who drive electric vehicles wear dirty underwear. And that was the like That's the still thought, true, but uh, they're making a statement. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the belief was this was like the thing you'd find at the other side of the art fair. You know, yeah. like when you went to a goofy art fair and there'd be like a row of unusual electric cars that were one-offs. This is kind of what EVs were in like 2000. Yeah. You know? And every other appliance kind of, you know, what is it called? Compliance car from the OEMs in that first decade or so also met that same kind of standard, which is they really didn't want to do it. And so, you know, from my perspective, Tesla's real value is just the electrification movement, not the AV piece. Of course. You know? Well, that's that's why I, I ask how much credit we need to continue I think 20, yeah. in an ongoing I think a basis. Trailing 20 year. Because it's like, uh, to me, it's like a band that has an amazing first album, sure. but doesn't really have a follow up. Yeah. I think and, it's more like Mel Gibson. It's like he did great work for 30 years, yeah, yeah. and then he started to say things. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, you, you, and everyone's like, but remember Tweet things, yeah. Well, because, because Tesla did like really great stuff, but then since then they've just their their image has been so fraught with problems. Yeah, I mean, I I I I really do appreciate the contribution to electric cars. I have an sure. electric car. I like my electric car. Yeah. Um, but the the electric car experience for the consumer in 2022 is no longer unique to Tesla. Agreed. Um, and a it's lot of better thing... with Tesla, though I will say, like charging wise. Sure, it's better. It's much better with Tesla. Yeah. I think the hard part is the vehicles are getting good from other manufacturers, but right. the whole consumer experience is still much better if you just simply buy Tesla for probably the next five years. Could be. I would argue. Could be. Thank so. God Electrify America is having such problems, basically. <laughs> yeah, right. They are having yeah. a lot of – and all the other networks, too. I mean, they're just mm -hmm. not good enough. So, yeah. um, And I think one of the mistakes is just thinking the EV is just about the EV itself and not all these other components, mm -hmm. like charging and everything else. So it's – I don't know. Every time I've tried to charge my Ford in public, it has been – Imperfect, right? Not like a disaster, right? And not something that I couldn't mm -hmm. eventually yeah. get to work or whatever. But it has been an imperfect experience. Whether sure. it was the thing doesn't want to connect to the car, whether it was the uh, the fact that I when I bought the car I got two hundred and fifty kilowatts of free charging right. and that ran out without me getting a notification. Oh, really? Yeah, That's yeah. Uh, whether it was sometimes the credit card reader didn't want to work, mm -hmm. the connection to the app or the, you it know, whatever like it is. It like an old car. Like my, my take on these like current cars with crappy EV charge networks is it makes you feel like you have an old car again. Kind of. You're like, I, oh, I this guess. doesn't work. I always assume that something won't work. Yeah. is the default thing with a lot of those networks. Which, I mean, very fortunately <laughs> between, you know, my house and you might have noticed outside here, we've got level two chargers. And yeah. so I've yeah. I've had this car for almost a year and I've had to charge in public four times. So yeah. it's not like it's a regular thing, but it's yeah. definitely something that requires yeah. consideration. Do you have EVs in here, pure BEVs that people store? Yes, we have, uh, there's a Tesla Roadster. Okay, so an um, OG. An OG. That's it, valuable now. It's a fucking piece of junk, but but it is. Va <laughs> but that's why the buy person is storing it because yeah, it was it, it will, was and it will be worth a lot more. Too. Yeah, it will. It's, I I understand it as yep. a collector's item. I totally do. But yep. it it makes really strange noises mm -hmm. uh, just sitting there, which mm -hmm. is really weird. And someone uh, fucked off to their Europe house at the beginning of COVID and left his Model X here. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so the no, fortunately, those the the cars that are in storage, they're just plugged into. One tenth. Yeah, you know, sure same will. as yep. same as any other yeah. car with a with a sure. battery tender. Yeah, that's so that's fine. that's it's not been an issue. That's good. Yeah. Cool. And when when members here leave their EV daily drivers of all yeah. kinds, we we top them off on the on that's the quicker good. chargers for them. Yeah. yeah, it's cool. Our new our second facility will have four level two chargers. Where's the new facility? Gardena. Awesome. Right by the Hawthorne yeah. Airport. Cool. Um, but anyway, back to the to the to yeah. the point at hand. So, if if the privately owned autonomous car mm -hmm. is not really realistic for a while for a, a long while yeah um, for a variety of reasons mm -hmm. where do you see AVs trickling into our lives outside uh, as regards public public roads and public places 
uh, in the next 10, 15 years in very, very limited capacities. Mm. Um, with parcels and with commerce and things like that, yes. But um, as far as, I, I think of the utility of Uber as the great benchmark for these things. You know, can I actually go to any airport and just, I haven't thought about it before and I just pull up the app and then someone picks me up in an AV. That to me is a 20, late 2030s kind of concept in my mind. Is that like, does, is there is there a real benefit to that besides eliminating a person's job? <laughs> Well, there's. I'm not trying to sound like a, a dick, but no, like I hear you saying, it's you know, a, it's same thing question. with bus drivers. Like people yeah. keep talking about an an auto an automated shuttle bus of some sure. kind, right? And it's like, do we really need this very expensive, complicated system when right. all we're doing is eliminating a human's job? Yes, that's a great a great question. I think if you think about most of the time you know, human driven cars are parked. And so the dream of a lot of the stuff, particularly in city centers, is that you don't have to work. First of all, you don't have to drive around looking for a spot like I was doing earlier and you don't have to park the car because theoretically it goes and has utility for somebody else. Mm -hmm. So that's like the core fundamental part of this argument in cities. For all the other components of the drive, it's usually safety related and saying, we're going to make these basically uncrashable or they're going to be so much safer than a normal human driving these cars out in the hinterlands. Yeah. Um, but the argument in, in cities is look at all the parking you free up and we still have so much. But don't those cars then, what, aren't they just circling? Like, well, how does that work? Does theoretically. That, is, that, is, that a, is that not well, a net zero argument? Theoretically, if you think about it, most Uber drivers, I don't know about right now, but certainly pre-pandemic, they were, you know, trip chaining from one trip to the next. So there's very little time in an urban core when a driver's at a Starbucks parking lot waiting for a ride. Okay. You know, very, I, I never hardly see that anymore. So um, that's the idea for a lot of those cars too. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. But first, before we get there, it's going to be farming and it's going to be mining and yeah. it's going to be construction work. Exactly. Yeah. And do you see... But also just ADAS. Like I feel a lot of people undervalue how good ADAS systems are in very cheap cars. You know, like mm -hmm. it, uh, the most garden variety Kias and Mazdas have a level one system, which is phenomenal benefit to the consumer for like 1100 bucks. I mean, mm -hmm. less than that now. The packages are so incredible for the ACC systems. Yeah. And in my view, Radar level Cruise one, is like great. It, it's so it's good. It's great. It's so good. I use it in every car that c comes with it. Yeah. Like, and I feel like that system is developed enough, like, where, like, okay, I'm using my hands. Am I, I, so I, ha I know my hands are steering the car, right. so I have to remain. This a, is my argument. This is, this is almost a different engagement. version of the FSD argument, which is, in my mind, level one is the best system today. Yeah. Because you have to act, you get the fatigue reduction right. on long drives, which is wonderful. You can get out of the car after eight hours of driving and feel totally fine. But you've been engaged enough where you're actually watching everything because you have to steer. Yeah. So you have to control the you know the sort of side to side. Isn't it weird how much of that fatigue, when you think about the human body, comes from the simple uh, moving of your foot and pulleys, right? You know, back yeah. and forth. Right. <laughs> Whereas with your hand, you know, yeah, it, you don't get tired from the hands right. so much, but the feet, yeah. dra drains it out. It's weird, right? Totally. I've done nine cross country trips with my dog, Walter Brennan, and um, we've done probably 95% of those miles using ACC. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just phenomenal. And it's all it's the right amount of uh, fatigue reduction and right amount of, you know, ADAS and also the right amount of human. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, most people don't even know they have ACC. Uh, and also the other thing about ACC is the interface is so different. So I'm sure you, you guys For are, some reason, you have no idea we're talking, we're talking about adaptive cruise control, correct. also known as radar cruise control. Correct. Yeah. Which is funny that it's called different things. But you know that little pop-up in the HUD that's typically showing you how far you You're can following create the, distance, the, yeah. and the, the distance they want you. You can slow down. Those are so different that you go from car to car, and it takes you so long to figure out, like, how to modulate that and what five bars mean yeah. in a Mazda mm -hmm. versus a Mercedes is totally yeah. different. Yeah. You know what's weird about those systems to me is, like, sometimes, like, they're – the the bad thing about them is if you're in a, a place with aggressive drivers, right? You know, the you, cut ins, the cut ins, the cut -ins you end up are the just, just getting dive bombed. You have just. to al always sort of have your finger ready for the cut ins. Mm -hmm. on the, yeah, exactly. But it's but you know that just means maybe it's a little too dense for you to be using it Perhaps. in the first place. But that's actually where it's the most beneficial usually, right? Like on yeah. the four hundred five, 
and it's crazy traffic. So, yeah, yeah. And I don't mind the the systems that that will steer the car at you know zero to twenty. Mm-hmm. You know, on the freeway, geofenced mm-hmm. yep. to freeway, yep. and yep. you know, we'll we'll just you know, okay, follow that sure. car in front of me in this yep. traffic jam. Yep. Um, I, I'm not that opposed to that, but it's definitely when you've got two way traffic, cross traffic, sure. stops. Then, it, then yeah. it's like, oh, dude, come on, just drive, yeah. just fucking drive yeah. the car. This is why this this particular what we're talking about here is why transportation is such a complicated and incredible place to spend your life's work. Yeah. Because transportation and automobiles, any kind of these forms, are almost like thinking about a knife, which is to say, on their own, they could potentially have harm or benefit, depending on how you choose to use it, right? Mm -hmm. So like policies that, you know, create free parking and cheap gas means people generally buy huge cars, like 9,000 pound cars, and just drive everywhere. Um, And so, the, the space requires really hard discussions like this constantly. And so I like your Twitter is maybe, I don't know if it's like mine. I don't know, probably not like mine, but um, I feel like I consume- Mine's a shit show. A, yeah, it's like, <laughs> but it's a diet of people on both sides, right? It's like supercar enthusiasts and bicycle enthusiasts and policy people and people who are like into King of Hammers yeah. and Monster Truck. I mean, it's like mm-hmm. that whole feed. And I think that that's actually- why it's such a great place to do this sort of stuff, you know? Well, it's hard to be a car enthusiast in America and also be an urbanist. Correct. And also be a progressive, you know, and also want to have a planet that's not like we're not breathing in carbon monoxide, you know? Um, And you want to be, you want to live in the real world, but you also want to see possibility. Yeah. Um, And so what do you think we could, what do you think we could do in the densest parts of our country mm-hmm. to help people like is it do we need to really is it do we need to build trains do we need to have bird scooters mm-hmm. is it last mile like is it bicycling and e-bikes like mm-hmm. what do you think could deliver the best result in the urban environment without completely fucking over car people just make it safe for people to walk around is mm-hmm. a good first step which is actually in most U.S. cities really a hard challenge, which is why you remember the woman who died as a result of the Uber test vehicle in Elaine Helsberg. Right. I mean, she was walking across an area which you, theoretically pedestrians shouldn't be walking across. Um, and even just- It was the, like a service road. A service it was like a road. three lanes exactly. on each way kind of thing. Which like, feels like it's everywhere in Arizona, right? <laughs> like you see those kind yeah. of like large multiple things coming together and- um, so just if you made it easy to walk, that would be step one. And then maybe go up one class and say, okay, it's, then it's easy to bike. Mm-hmm. So it's the, you probably remember hearing about like the Halloween candy test of neighborhoods where would you feel comfortable letting your kids go get Halloween candy in this neighborhood? And what that is a in some ways like a proxy for, like, is it kind of a safe street? Are there like, are there sidewalks? Are the sidewalks easy to get across? Or are these huge, you do have these huge nine lane kind of expanses of, of concrete. So just start with pedestrians. Mm-hmm. And if you look at it, you know, most of America is just optimized for fast car traffic. Yeah. But not in a good way, not in like a car enthusiast way. It's for like fast, just crappy commuter traffic. Yeah, yeah. So it's not, it's actually not beneficial to people who just want to walk or people who are quote unquote car enthusiasts. It's no one wins with the way that, our roads are currently structured. Well, wasn't it? Wasn't it designed just for efficiency of automotive travel? Yeah, it's usually like designed for traffic flow, mm-hmm. right? And so, um, you, there was this announcement last week about Paris shutting down some of the core parts of the city. Yeah, I saw that. You it's know, interesting. which is fascinating, and we'll see what that means for other areas that kind of take their cue from Paris. So that's the first step. That's the first goal: is just make it safe for people to walk. By the way, when you do that, you tend to have good restaurants and you tend to have outdoor dining. Places to have coffee. And, yeah, yeah. And it's like so. I went to Amsterdam a couple of years ago, 2019 mm-hmm. summer, and they had banned gas and diesel cars from the city yeah, center, yeah. the historic art, right. during I forget the exact hours, but most of the day. Sure. Um, except for unloading at night. Yeah. Except for unloading at night, yeah. and you could still have uh, EVs. Yeah. Um, you could still have um, electric bicycles. Um, yeah. And I think I think there might have been a certain certain types of taxis. I mean, I, I definitely took a Tesla Model X taxi. Yeah. In Amsterdam, but I remember from the last time I had been there, which was maybe 2014 or 2015, to then, it was like 
very pleasant. <laughs> it was it's so super nice. Right? It was so yeah, great. Super, I, mean, I didn't realize nice. like yeah. you know how how little I missed the ambient noise. And granted, right. I was visiting. I didn't have to live yeah. there, yeah. but it really made that city such a pleasant right. uh, place to be yeah, at all hours of the day. From the, the cleaner air to the the lack yeah. of sound and and you know it's a smaller small ish place, so you get around on bikes or sure. on foot, and it's not a big deal. And I realize that might not work in Los Angeles, where things are a little more spread. Out. spread sure. But um, and they're they're. Every that's, city has like this is your that's Zach. Zach the doorbell is yeah. uh, Zach's press car is going away. That's okay. We'll continue. You keep going. Um, I feel like most cities can't rep. You can't replicate like you know in Amsterdam or something like that in Los Angeles. You no, but you of, could in a Boston yeah, or a, or, or a Manhattan yeah, or sure. Brooklyn or yeah. or the very dense right. old school American cities. You yeah. could. Yeah. Yeah. We're post sprawl here. We're fucked. Totally. Just like X. X Beyond sprawl, yeah. yeah, or like Houston, like Houston's uh, Houston's yeah, fucked. So like it's 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 actually, just should be ten cities <laughs> yeah. instead of one city. Yeah, yeah. is know. there I mean, any hope for those for these sprawled cities like a, an LA or a Vegas or a Houston, not Ve- or a Houston or a Phoenix, um, or is it are we are we beyond help at this point? Well, there is. I mean, there are models for cities that have, you know, kind of grown like that. I mean, the the most kind of famous one is probably Tokyo, hmm. which has tended to have development around things like stations so they basically build a station for a train and then around the station you have life yeah. proof of life you have right. basically schools and you have retail and stuff like that and that's an interesting example because it's like the density of new york but the size but the of la of a houston fucking huge right I, yeah. that what an intimidating place to go because totally. it's, it's so fucking big and so dense but it does it, it has solved that particular it is almost like i'm sure that somebody on in the comment section will proved to me that it's so different from Houston, but it feels like it has the size of Houston, but with the density of a Paris or New York, right? yeah. or more so, right, yeah. obviously. So now the, the, the problems with, um, with the U.S. Uh, transportation networks is also just our lack of commitment to budget in transportation right. and civil, like a lot of civil stuff that we used to do well 50, 80 years ago. So we spent about 2.5% GDP on transportation and bridges and stuff like that. Um, and in China, they spend eight percent. Right. So, like, even if we I was just reading this, a book called uh, "How Are You Going to Pay for That?" I just read. I haven't read that. This. Is talks about this type of okay. stuff, like why yeah. why this type of investment yes. in our infrastructure, our social needs, our right. health needs, why it, how it it pays off dividends for decades and decades. Yeah, yeah. But we don't have we can't we don't have the stomach for that. Yeah. So even if we got religion and we said, okay, we're going to double what we spend in transportation, get to five percent. Yeah, we'd still be so far behind. Yeah, what like the modern world is doing. Yeah. Um, what about so, on a micro level? Like three years ago, all of a sudden, fucking scooters, scooters yeah. everywhere. Yeah. And it took a year for it to like, all right, sure. how do we make these right. not trash? Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, but but has that changed the space? Because I I live in Venice. Mm-hmm. It's tourists, right? Who, yeah. we, who do we see on bird scooters? We sure. see tourists fucking around. Yeah. I don't know a lot of people that use a bird scooter to commute, but that's just my little world. Mm-hmm. In in a, in a macro sense, and I realize I'm using the word macro in related to micro mobility, yes. are, but is, has that solved or, or really contributed to a last mile situation um, or not really? Or is it still just toys? Well, I think, to be honest, I think most of the scooters today uh, – that have been available are kind of like baby versions of micro mobility. Like they're not great products. Um, and a lot of people who have used scooters, I remember that we were talking to this one guy who worked for one of the big scooter companies. And he said, after somebody took 17 rides per month on their platform, they dropped off. And this was like a common thing. Like they take about 17 rides and they, they leave. It's not because they, they don't like micro mobility anymore. In fact, they love it so much they bought an e-bike. Mm-hmm. Got they it. bought a device. So yeah. they're like, why am I paying $5, $6 a drink? I've done this all month. I'm going to buy something. And yeah. they usually buy a bicycle, e-bike, not a um, not a scooter. Yeah. I used to use so, it a good bit to go to your house. But then after, I used, I use it a lot of times. Yeah. And I realized that it was a few dollars cheaper than taking a lift, but mm-hmm. like literally two to three. And I had to consider how much I could bring, can sure. I bring food to your house, whatever. Right. So mm-hmm. like I can see why you would do it a few times and then go, well, either I'm going to start using Lyft again or I'll get an e-bike that has a basket and it's a little bit more usable and you own it. Yeah. E-bikes are pretty badass now. 
They are. I mean, and cargo space, you can drive awesome. on one hand. You can't do that with a scooter today. Yeah. No. So there's I have a new one scooter of those company. Vintage electric bikes that fucking flies. It's called oh, by the vintage. The company, company. Yeah, 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 the company. I've seen those. It yeah. does forty. It's so that's amazing. Fast. Yeah, I like I like <laughs> when those so, e-bikes feel dangerous. It's so dangerous, yeah. dude. Yeah. <laughs> have it you all, a Super it almost done burnouts. Like yeah, it's, they're they're really Super seventy threes are great. Yeah. My assistant manager here commutes on it's, a Super seventy three. That's a very SoCal yeah kind of commute. Thing, totally. Seventy three, and they're comfy. They're great they, with that sort of old school motor like motocross seat, like a Rupp mini bike. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're the cool. 70s. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. To, but so most people after they take a they, bunch they of rides, just, they just buy a, yeah, a so bike. Th- the, to get to your question, I think these are great solutions because the 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 guts of those vehicles really came out of the toy supply chain, which is interesting. So like hobbyist drones and stuff like that. And the first really good product was called uh, the Boosted Board, which mm-hmm. came out about a decade ago. Yeah, yeah. And We see a bunch of those yeah, in Venice. Yeah, th- and they're fantastic. Yeah. And the early prototypes for that, um, the founder of it, he basically took parts from like the toy supply chain. And you, people didn't think you could put a human on something like that and use those parts. And that's what really kicked off this whole wave. And so now you can obviously carry 200 pound men on yeah. these small little things that are one wheels and exactly like, yeah it's, it's amazing so i mean we have a, a van moof bike at home um and i love stuff like that and it's only going to get better and better and faster i actually think that the e-bike and micro mobility world has to have a like an ecstatic fringe which is a little bit i've been trying to push people to create basically illegal more illegal e-bikes that break the law because i the e-bike world, I think, for too long, and the the scooter world has always been looked at as something that, um, like, doesn't sort of garner the respect of the chess beating sort of like car enthusiast world. Are you saying we need the General Motors Hummer of e-bikes? No, no? I, I'm so. thinking more of like the Smoky Eunuch, <laughs> which is oh, like okay. there's like a yeah. weird tinkerer, and he and you mm. you kind of like you can't get him legally, but you could find somebody who knows somebody, and then you can get the yeah. crazy hundred mile per hour e-bike. Well, my my vintage electric has yeah. this very silly, but for some reason necessary, like a red key. Yeah. Like a Hellcat Red Key, where it goes 27, like yeah. but if you put yeah. this thing mm-hmm. in, it'll go 40, mm-hmm. you know? And mm-hmm. so it's got that kind of like, ooh, let's I think put we the Red Key that. in. Yeah. yeah, we need more of that. Because the those devices are so fun. Most people just haven't uh, ridden one of those, had ridden a bike that goes that fast. And once they do, they're like, wow, this is actually different than a bicycle. Yeah. This is a cool thing. I actually think the speed, if I'm going to be riding it on the street, Next to cars, the speed makes it safer for sure. Because it goes it goes sure. fast enough where I can keep up with a car, yeah. and, or get and out cars of the way from and cars car. aren't right. always just coming from behind. You yeah. know, I can be at sure. kind of the same pace as a car on on the road. Yeah, um, yeah. But I, the e-bikes rule. I e-bikes just worry right. about locking them up sometimes. That's the only right. thing. Is is I? But you know, that's true. We have a, there's a new company that we invested in that basically has a. A, like a sentinel that is always watching around oh, really? it so that if you were to walk nearby or take the bike that it can like, like it freaks it, out it triggers like a, a live person to watch it and oh really yeah it'll I be like out that. there Boston year. Dynamics dog oh cool yeah there's like a real person that comes out of the club yeah I want one that like electrifies the frame that's a just good idea. I tell shocks, that. Your, shocks your shocks yeah. the South African bike alarm <laughs> that's yeah so what are like so you said you know um, you've, you've invested in lots of things that were like abject failures sure because they that's were too early the, or way too game, early part of the business what are, give me a couple if, if you can remember offhand of some some maybe humorous uh, things that seemed like a, a very good idea at the time, but we're just not. Um, well, I mean, our our companies when we the day we invested, we thought they were that we were geniuses and that they were too, right? Yeah. The very first day you make the investment, you always think like that. And most of I would say out of the we've done about fifty investments, uh, fifty one or fifty two um, as a team. Uh, none of them are actually sound like bad ideas. I will say that. We've heard a lot of pitches that are completely insane and incredible, like, you know, um, catapulting uh, people in the air, like, you know, um, <laughs> under, sorry, under the, <laughs> yeah, people catapulting. Nitro and circus micromobility. That kind of it. stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, basically reusing uh, World War II era um, uh, 
almost like w- what would look like a pneumatic bank tube, but to put parcels in underground in certain cities where they had oh. identified certain pipes that were not being used. Oh, that's kind that of are interesting. Like Eighty years old, so just kind of fun, crazy stuff. Is, People is still a fun are still pitching pneumatic delivery, huh? Yeah, oh yeah, it's still yeah. going on. Yeah, that is one of yeah. the most fun ways to deliver something. It is. I like it. The I mean, best. Yeah, yeah, whenever I get to go the to best. an old school bank, yeah. and, pff, I mean, it's dude, the, it's the best feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we see a thousand companies a year. So, what about like drone delivery? Is drone delivery? Do you think that's really going to be a, be a thing soon? We haven't done a lot of that uh, at our little fund, but um, there are certainly a lot of. I feel like in healthcare and a lot of developing world stuff, the drone stuff is actually working right now. And, is and, it? Yeah. So the Google had a, a big project. Um, big drone project. There's a handful of drone companies that are actually doing deliveries. You wouldn't think about it that they are. Is that the one just that like <laughs> long range medical supply? Exactly. Just so drops like, it? yeah, the, wow. the idea of like getting a taco in San Francisco from a drone is probably not going to happen. Yeah. But a lot of the commercial B two B drone stuff is a, is actually happening. You know I'm what? Glad the one focus <laughs> on medicine instead of tacos. I genuinely because well, like, here's we the one that we were that. just talking about on the don't. golf course on Saturday. Uh, uh, I think it, I'm pretty sure they demonstrated. Michael Jordan has a golf club that he's a part owner of in, oh, really? in North Carolina and you can order food or drink that will be droned from the clubhouse no way. to you on the golf course. Let's go. I don't Allegedly. Like golf, I'll go check that. Like I saw I saw the demo video of uh-huh. it and I haven't I've never received a bloody uh-huh. mary from a drone <laughs> but it was it was being talked about at the golf club. Yeah, drone delivery at uh That's Michael good. Jo- I mean, apparently it's, uh, look, Michael Jordan's Grove 23 using drones to deliver drinks. It's in Florida, not North Carolina, excuse me. I mean, Mm -hmm. here's a video. Play that. Chadillac FSU. I mean, <laughs> shout out, shout out to our That's boy. For, yeah, here is a uh, here's a six that rotor. Looks like he's carrying a coffin. Co- he, 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 really That's not. a really strong drone, by the way. A six rotor. A six. Yeah, this is like what uh-huh. like a, a real estate agent would use to shoot aerial photos of. Mm-hmm. Uh, Wow, look at it. It's and it's got. Uh, it looks like it's got a, a it's, it looks kind of mini sketchy, coffin coming in. And uh, it's dropping off a beverage. Gotta hope it's balanced perfectly. Wow. Right? Like, That's what so if it's sp- and it's just it's going big. right on the Look green? It. it really is big. Just <laughs> right wow. on the green. <laughs> oh wow! The thing that it's carrying looks like oh, it's smaller. Okay, the thing that's okay. the box it's carrying. It looks like it's about uh, three feet by one oh, foot. He's got beers in it. Oh wow! He's <laughs> got, yeah, it's got bottles of beer. It's got like uh, holders, like a like yeah. a wine carrier. Probably operated by a human that sitting much, in, in an much office. There, just thought. you know, flying the thing. Oh, yeah. for sure. Yeah. No, it, there's no way it's yeah. like fully automated. No. It's definitely yeah. some some intern has like the best job ever. Yeah. Totally, yeah. <laughs> like getting that's high great. and delivering fucking beers via drone. Yeah. That's funny. But um, that that might be more efficient than uh, having the the cart girls uh, go around. Quicker, you on on could put a taco speed. in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's true. Yeah. And depending on what their dues are, I'm sure they might be able to justify that. That's right. I bet yeah. you dues at Michael Jordan's yeah. fucking golf club are That's astronomical. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> He'll yeah. bet you your dues if you end up on a hole and he's like, hey, you want to play for free one year? I'll yeah. bet you I would be But in an play. urban environment, like the last thing I want is just to hear fucking package drones flying over my I head all the time. You. Yeah. I, I'm also wondering, you know, seems like a lot of cities are going to crack down on the, the number of places that... Amazon can have in a city to deliver you packages. Mm-hmm. So there's this new story I read about San Francisco looking at the next at Amazon distribution center and basically waving them off and saying, we don't think you can do that. And I think there's going to be a moment where... A traditional one, a traditional... Just a normal DC. Just, yeah. yeah. Do you see the one around the corner yeah. right here? Yeah. It's fucking huge. Yeah, they're all huge. And I think... It's like ants marching every hour on the hour. It's just these the gray, trucks, the gray trucks. Yeah. Just... Are they transits or are they Rivians here yet? Their transits. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like we'll probably get to the point where we have one delivery mo- window a day from some of these companies, mm. um, and certainly electric. So, you know, by the end of this decade, you probably won't be able to do a commercial delivery in a city unless you're running an electric vehicle. That to me, I mean, we we talked a few times about this USPS thing with Oshkosh. It's, just, it's, it's ridiculous, total right? Insane. Totally it's, ridiculous, it's, right? It's, We're not crazy, no, right? No, it's it's. It's really ridiculous. Yeah, okay. Like eight percent of the fleet would be electric. <laughs> yeah. Just for the press release. And this yeah. is for and this is for, they a, last for a use case right. where the vehicle literally drives the same route every single perfect, day. Perfect thing for an <laughs> it's EV. A perfect thing. Yeah. Put in the exact size battery pack right. you need for the mission. Exactly. And yeah. I mean what what like 
why wouldn't they just do it? Is it because they're concerned about longevity or charging or or is it just a kickback scheme or what? A great question. I I actually think that most of this was pretty well baked, even though the the RFP went out, I mean, five years ago, 10 years, I mean, a really long time ago. Um, But by the time Biden got in, I think most of it was fully baked. But he should have the wherewithal to just stop it and say, this needs to be completely bev. Yeah. There's no excuse why these, and the longest route is still pretty short. Yeah, it's yeah, like 100 miles like 100 would, be the, mile. would be a rural type route. You could run route. transit EVs or whatever. Yeah. And just make – that would be a huge step up from what the current plan is. So, um, And our – you know, the country is one of the, the – postal fleet is one of the biggest kind of like gasoline um, purchasers in the in the world. Like yeah. it, They just spend a lot. So um, I love the old Grumman S10 marshmallow trucks. I mean, I love them. In, they're in, awful. In fear, yeah. yeah, I love like in, the, a, char- in yeah, a charmingly charming. nostalgic way. In yeah, a yeah. Forget, forget yeah. In a charming way. Yeah. yeah. But I, I, yeah. Uh, I, I completely agree that like it just, that seems like with a, such a predictable, repetitive right. route, it makes no sense. It does. Right. To, to not have just, you know, have here's three different battery pack sizes, you know, city, suburb, and Long rural distance, yeah. or whatever. And yeah. It's hard to believe we ended up there based on merit. That's, you know, based <laughs> yeah, on exactly. 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 Right. Yeah. Yeah. Very well said. Yeah. 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 What other, um, you know, what other like commercial applications could really, really benefit? Like trucking isn't really gonna right because the, the weight. EV. Yeah, because the weight is t- t- too much. Yeah, right? probably the distances. Not. I, mean, I bet actually this is you know how you've been going to press events for a long time and how Toyota and GM tried to push hydrogen on people two oh, years yeah. ago, and I actually think that. You know, maritime and trucking and aviation is where we'll finally see a hydrogen being used in some of these ways. Um, it doesn't really make any sense for passenger cars yeah. in most of the world. Zach uh, got stranded at the Harris Ranch trying to fill a hydrogen. <laughs> really? The was hydrogen the station or ran or out. What was it? Uh, Hyundai Nexo. Oh, yeah. 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 It doesn't make much sense for that. <laughs> it doesn't, but it yeah. makes, it, like for, you said, it the, does make sense for the trucks for the and stuff. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, the Nikola thing that happened two years ago, that actually, I think, We'll put hydrogen trucks back, you know, at least a couple of years just because that was such a debacle, right? And, that truck um, ran on gravity. That's amazing. It, it didn't actually run on hydrogen, <laughs> right? It was just, just uh, gravity. coasted uh, yeah. well, very well. Yeah. The beautiful coasting right. vehicle. Right. Well, we'll have those. We'll have hydrogen trucks. We'll have hydrogen planes. Um, so that would be yeah. interesting. Mm-hmm. I mean, because be- with hydrogen planes, I mean, it makes. Perfect sense. You have like, there's a fixed number of sure. places where you yeah. would fill them. Like yeah. you, you can make a jet turbine run on hydrogen pretty easily, right? Yeah, and you know the aviation world has not had any zero emission pressure yet. So like the the road transport world in all the major economies has really had a lot of pressure. Um, and obviously with Europe and China, they're really going full electric. And you look at aviation, and there's been nobody who's been responsible for saying like you have to have a zero emission plan. And I actually think that the pendulum is going to swing pretty hard when a lot of these OEMs and the airliners are forced to have a zero emission plan or at least some sort of um, tax they might pay if they aren't. And so hydrogen is probably the answer there. In the next 10 years, I bet we're, we'll actually have hydrogen It wouldn't flights. be uh, – would it be a fuel cell? No. It, or would it just burn hydrogen? Just burn hydrogen. It would just burn yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. You don't need – you don't yeah. actually need to have the whole fuel yeah. cell situation, I mean, you, right? There are companies working on that too. So. Yeah. There's a lot of, right now in the hydrogen aviation world, we see a lot of pitches. We invest in a company called Universal Hydrogen, which is based here in LA. They basically make a Keurig cup model where they don't make the hydrogen, they just make the canisters that allow you to safely move around the hydrogen. Mm-hmm. And other people are working on the, you know, other parts of the ecosystem, like the planes and the fuel cells and stuff. Is there like, what about like uh, Shipping and like heavy yeah, fuel sure. oil and stuff like that. Yeah. That that seems like it could be because you have only so many ports where you can have a giant container ship, right? But like, yeah. is that is that realistic or am I am I too it, no, pie in the sky? For no, that? I mean those are that's a those are great applications for hydrogen. I just think that um, in shipping, you're probably even further behind aviation in terms of somebody demanding that the current operator do something. Right. So you know. I think a lot of the car companies, frankly, would not be building electric cars if no one told them they had to. Of course. Right? And in aviation, no one's really telling any of the manufacturers or the airliners they have to run some sort of zero emission thing. But my take on this is I think 10 years out from 
the kind of where we are today with road transport. I think aviation is like about ten years behind, and maritime is probably another ten or twenty years behind that, just because there's no nobody demanding it. In terms of until the cost gets so amazing that they're like they realize mm-hmm. it from greed alone right. that they need it. Yeah. Well, you need you need capital. If it doesn't work for capitalism, yes. it doesn't work for America. Right. Exactly. Speaking of which, um, to shoot back to to passenger cars for a minute. Um, infrastructure is an issue, right? With in terms of charging stations and yep. and uh, the the connectivity with different vehicles sure. and and you you like although like we said Tesla has the best you know charge network right now, mm-hmm. but I feel like in the grand scheme of things, it's not good if we have one make. Agreed. You know, yeah. it's not good for the world sure. to have a, a one brand charging station. It's yeah. better if all the station, you know, yeah. imagine like my Ford could only go to mobile gas stations sure. like that would make it fucking sense. suck. Right. So um, what do you think other than just massive, you know, government incentives? What is, what is your do you, what is your thoughts on how we can get public charging infrastructure where it needs to be, where we're moving from a. To, to a real significant percentage of adoption? Uh, well, you know, it's funny because most EV owners don't do a lot of public charging. They mostly charge at home. Mm-hmm. And that assumes, of course, that today's EV owner has a garage yeah. and can plug in somewhere. Um, Every time I try and make the apartment argument that we need to yeah. incentivize landlords and whatnot yeah. to... Yeah. I get hit with this statistic that actually 85% of America that owns a car also lives in a single family home or something like that. So the, I don't know how true that is. but In certain communities, those numbers might be right. But I think it's safe to say most people who have bought an electric car today have had a lot of money. And then almost by definition, they've lived in a single family home, mm-hmm. right? Because they've just been so expensive. Mm-hmm. So Europe is going through a different thing, which is a lot of those vehicles have small battery packs. They're cheaper. And so they've been bought by people who in multifamily, you know, establishments. And th- so there's been a greater need for, like, the multi-tenant charging thing, which is really interesting. Um, but our infrastructure in the U.S. for charging, I think we'll probably build more chargers than we need, which is totally fine, to convince a lot of people that there's enough chargers for them. Mm-hmm. The number of chargers you actually need to use is a, fall, a far smaller number than the ones you need to see in your mind before you actually buy an EV. That's interesting. And so the you could argue a lot of the you know level two chargers that are going to be supported by a lot of the Build Back Better stuff, are they actually necessary? Will they be in high utilization? Absolutely not. But will they act, will they have a benefit for people going electric in certain communities where they haven't seen a lot of them? Yes, they'll help nudge everybody sure. who's a little resistant to it. Yeah, you just sure. need to know it's there. You need to know it's there and that it's working. So, mm-hmm. a lot of the problems with uh, charging is just they frankly don't work. You know, yeah. like you pull to a charger and it just you know somebody's cut the cable or there's vandalism or the network card needs to be restarted. Yeah. So it's like really, I think a lot of and I would argue against a lot of the the Biden support up until recently has been just to build the chargers. They haven't really cared about um, fixing them. So a lot of, and government, the politicians think like this because most politicians are driven around in black Yukons, right? And <laughs> Suburbans, they don't really think about this at all. No. But the the average person deals with a lot of broken chargers a yeah. lot. I bet, you know, in your experience, I bet the last 10 experiences you've had trying to charge, I bet at least three of them have been. I said every single one has been one. imperfect. Imperfect yeah. in one way or another. Yeah. Whether that means call the service number and have them reset it. Yeah. Whether that means the Amex sticker sure. is right there next to and the they, Visa sticker, but the Amex doesn't sure. work and the Visa yeah. does. Yep. Whether that means I connect to the car and it says charging completed and I have to start it over. Or right. whether that means I have to try this one and then yeah. I have to try this one. I mean, when Zach and I were in Vegas... We had to try uh, at, at a major station, had probably eight, eight 150s. Yeah. We had to try three. Mm-hmm. I think it was the third the third yeah. one that, that's, that worked. That's super that's common. That's unacceptable. It's I mean, super it's common. Totally it, it's unacceptable. actually what you read about in the, the early 20th century and people trying to fuel up their cars. Yeah. It was like those kind of experiences. So um, if you just made today's chargers work well 100% of the time, that, that would, would really be, be actually way better yeah. than just building more chargers. Because it's almost like... Putting on extensions of a uh, like adding onto a house that you don't have the maintenance to pay the core part for. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. You're like, well, yeah. why are we building another 
bedroom. <laughs> it's got 74 bedrooms, but exactly. the plumbing doesn't work at all. Yeah, it's like yeah. Mike Tyson's house in Ohio, <laughs> if you're, you know what I mean, like stuff like that. Yeah. So, so my philosophy on a lot of the charging stuff is what if we just simply made them all really great? Yeah. And I think the commercial answer to what do you do to have a really great common network is the reality is most networks other than Tesla are, are open to really any vehicle mm-hmm. with some exceptions of old plugs and everything. But if those were exceptional, those were the leading best in class, this wouldn't really be a problem. So yeah. I think the, the argument that I think a, a Tesla owner would make is, well, if you just make a, a network that's that's phenomenal, that's better than the Tesla network, we'll use that one. But until then, like all these number networks just really suck. I think what's well, one of the, the things that's eliminated by the Tesla network is the billing system. Yes. It goes through the car. Plug Charger charge. recognizes yeah. car. Yeah. Either it's either it's free for because they got that package or it's connected right. to your card within the car. Yep. And so the idea of, of okay, either I need to pay through an app or pay with a credit card. So sure. that step is eliminated, yeah. which is great. Yeah. And and I think they I think they just maintain them better. They maintain them better. Plug, yeah. plug and charge is this new term that maybe you guys have seen with some of the networks like EA, where um, plug and charge means you can do the same thing. So you pull the car up, you plug it in, and it just starts working. And that happened when I was on my free Ford, e, my free Ford mm-hmm. kilowatts. Yep. Once the free ran out, it went away. It went away, and now yeah. then I got hung up in the billing system and, yeah. and its hiccups. I've yeah. said I was with a uh, executive from a uh, not GM, but from a an auto company, like a supplier, um, very high up, and I asked him like, "Well, you know, have you have you benchmarked like all these system, all these charging networks, and isn't it just a?" poor substitute for the Tesla network. And he was like, to be honest, I've never driven a Tesla. I was like, dude, don't, let's not admit that in, in public yeah. anymore. Yeah. Go and fix that problem today. That, I, that, that's a problem I've seen, not just I haven't driven a Tesla, but I haven't driven whatever the competition yeah. is. Yeah, just the full complement. I, I hear that right. so often I think from we people can solve, who work in the business. We can solve a lot of executive problems if we just said, one, they don't get free cars from their company. We can give you a budget. We'll give you three thousand dollars a month to buy cars. You can buy some sweet cars for that. Yeah, lease cars, and you have to definitely drive the full range of the competition. Yeah, they, the the executive wing of car companies would be so much smarter if they did that. Yeah, it's important. But most of the time, executives get a car every three months. It's a big SUV because they probably have a big family, and they that's kind of it. They would yeah. never be caught dead driving a Tesla. Yeah. Well, so. in some, uh, we were going to one factory where there was a parking lot for like employees' cars. Oh, it was, if it was, it was GM. It was GM. It was, GM. If it was a GM car, but they sure. had a separate parking lot. I was like, if you drive something on a GM, sure. you park here, and it was just Dodge Super, everything else. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, if, if they're ostracized, it's like, well, you should drive the competition, but you right. shouldn't. Yeah. It's funny. I mean, I think that a lot of those things are part of the the executives running car companies right now generally came up in the business when Tesla didn't even exist. Think of what it's going to be like in 20 years from now when somebody who is 25 right now is running a car, running BMW in 20 years. Mm-hmm. It'll be so much more native that they believe that the world has fundamentally changed for them. So, yeah. And there's certain things that Tesla does in terms of just fun whimsy that I can like respect. Sure. You know, it's like great. their little light shows and shit and like just silly fart stuff like that. that your son would make. God bless. Yeah. I don't care right. if your car makes fucking farts. But yeah. but the it's the 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 misleading marketing and the beta yeah. testing of janky ass software on public roads I find to be yeah, incredibly dangerous. Not to mention taking money for product that doesn't exist. That's a that's <laughs> a problem. If you lease a car with the promise of that and then you've turned lease car back, you never got the benefit from it. I think yeah, that's really that's, I want I want to ask you a question, um, which is I I feel like you know a lot about tires. And a little bit. because Not of, as much as others, but I know something but about I, tires. I feel like whenever I watched or listened to your podcast or watch your show, you always focus a lot about the tire. When someone brings up the car, you're like, I think that was on these, like Pilot Sports Maybe. or whatever. And I'm just kind of fascinated on when that part of your knowledge started. Because when I, I, when I grew up, I was reviewing cars at car magazines and being a motor gopher and stuff like that. And I always found that the better product reviewers actually had so much more to talk about the tires than just the car. Yeah. And so the, the, the sort of phase one of product reviewing in the car world is always really about the vehicle. And then I think it comes down to a lot of the components, maybe the conditions, but certainly the tires. Yeah. I'm just wondering, like, when did you when did you start to I figure out that you could understand the tire? I went on a couple of tire launches. Like, uh, I haven't. I've been on four or five different tire launches, where uh, I did a BFG one, I did a, 
a Goodyear one. I've done two different Michelin ones. And where they had the same car on four or five different tires, which is a really... That's it's not something thing. you get to, to try a lot unless right. you work for, like, grassroots motorsports sure. or, like, tire rack. Right. You just don't get to do that. Yeah. And you realize, like, holy fuck. It's really this different. This same car yeah. can be changed so much yeah. with this with this set of tires. And yeah. so then that and then I really started thinking about it a lot when Paul and Roger died mm-hmm. uh, when they crashed yeah. because of their old shitty tires yeah. uh, that were hard as rocks because yeah. they were 10 years old and yeah. then it became more, more of a, like, do you think if they had been on on brand new tires that wouldn't have happened? Zero chance. Wow, they wouldn't have died. At That's all. amazing. They wouldn't have crashed. No, wow. it's that that was a ten year old car on ten year old fucking That's tires. That's insane. Original, yeah. Could, yeah. probably because they were like so expensive and particular to that car. There's hard no, replacements. No, that Roger had just bought the car and he had the new tires sitting there. Oh, and he hadn't put them on. It's yet. a real problem among. Uh, uh, the collect collectors of of cars, very high end cars, especially mm-hmm. two things that are a problem. One is there's a mistaken belief that the original tires for a car have some kind of value. Yeah, right. they don't. Yeah, and if they did, they certainly don't need to be attached to the fucking car. Yeah. They could be right. in a in bag over here, sure. and you throw them on the trailer when you sell the car, yeah. and that's fine. So that is a totally mis- mis- misguided belief that is not true at all. Or and also just not knowing, not understanding that that the it's not always about the tread wear; it's about the age of the rubber, and it just it gets harder and less yeah. effective over time. And once you get past five years, you need to start thinking about replacing those tires immediately. Sure. And yeah. where we really see it panning out in bad ways is cars that were of the era that where they were real fast but before you had stability control and they're also kind of valuable and a lot of in a lot of ways garage queens so we see yeah. it in uh diablos mm-hmm. we see it in ford gts uh yeah. second gen ford gts we see it in carrera gts mm-hmm. we see it in um porsche gt2s mm-hmm. um uh, 993 and 996 gt2s um you see a lot of folks who have the original tires on these cars and it's like dude you are going to die wow uh, is so, there a tire som like if you bought a you know one of those cars can mm-hmm. you call an expert and they're like well you know who doesn't work at it i don't want to talk to the guy who works at michelin but like somebody who's agnostic who's like a sommelier for tires and he's like here's what you should do I um pick i mean these three i mean can you do that? Usually with a car like that, you're <laughs> limited by what's available in terms right. of brand sure. new tires. So there's only a handful. It's of, only yeah. a handful of options. Right. And I would typically call the manufacturer of the of the of the car and say, What would I, what I, what should I do now? What's my best okay. option now for these? Um yeah. and when it comes to classics like a Diablo, Pirelli has reissued the original tires that they look like the tire that came on the car, but they have a more modern compound. That's a smart My one. Lamborghini Countach has those. That's amazing. The the tire looks just like it would have looked in eighty seven. Yeah. But it has a modern rubber compound on it, which is pretty cool. In the case That's of great. the Carrera GT, uh just the brand new pilot super sport would do it. You know, wow. you don't need to go. You don't need to go cr- too crazy. But yeah, that's that's kind of a thing. And can you important. now when you don't have the ability to benchmark one vehicle or the same vehicle on different tires? You still can feel tire in your evaluation of a car. Because not think that's always. Super interesting. Not always. We do our best. Yeah. You know, so, certain tires. Um, because we've driven on a bunch of cars, you can feel certain characteristics about them. Yeah. Some tires are particularly squealy. Mm-hmm. Some tires have softer sidewalls, and some have harder sidewalls. Sure. But other than that, not really. We usually just get. We have to kind of. So half guess at it. Yeah, it's usually yeah. something you can determine more easily if you're doing track testing, mm-hmm. because then you're getting sure. a lot of heat in the tires, multiple laps, sure. and you can see which ones fall off after three, four yeah. laps. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When I was young, I worked for the Corvette C5R program. Oh yeah, with Pratt and Miller. With Pratt Miller. Wow. And, cool. um, and the end of the O3 season, we were still running good years and starting to feel the heat from. There was a Celine that was really fast of the year, and also Pro Drive was. Is that an S seven? Celine S seven. Yeah, the mid engine car. Yeah. yeah, and then the Pro Drive cars were coming oh, look over. At, look at those C five Rs, the CompuWare cars. Exactly. Those yeah. fucking yeah. things. What a great looking race car. Unbelievable race car. But at the end of O three, because the street car had good years, so that those were terrible. Those Goodyear run flats, well, exactly. F ones, they were yeah. fucking garbage. I had a C five, and they were not good. Yeah, they weren't good. That's <laughs> that actually is probably an 
that's a that's an 04 car because it says Michelin on it. So at the end of 03, <laughs> um, the cost of moving from not only the internal strife of moving from the production rubber car to something else mm. to benefit the race program, um, but the team wanted to go to Michelin. And the cost was going to be a million bucks. And the one of the people, one of the very senior people at Pratt Miller, I want to say his name, was waiting for the GM guy to approve the purchase order because they're like winter testing starting. We sort of have to have the new tires. And he eventually just wrote the check personally really? to have the tire show up for the Sebring test, really? which is usually in February in March. Or I'd February. like to see his expense report later. Was that, totally. was, that, was that price like the buyout of the old contract or was it? I think it was the delta between the two oh my things. God. It was a million bucks. And the first, I was there at the winter test, wow. which also, it was that the year that, I remember we were there one year and um, at the winter test when the Columbia shuttle went down. I don't know if that was 03 or 04, but at the winter test, the very first lap, they went a second faster. <laughs> one second. Yeah, that's a ton. Which in motorsport is that's it's huge. like an hour. Yeah, yeah. And it's worth a million dollars to get yeah, it's worth that, second. And the car wasn't even like optimized. We were just like yeah. right out of the block, <laughs> right out of the box, like a second faster. Yeah. And that year, 04, uh, I think that was the year that the C5R won every race, yeah. including the Mont, <laughs> including Sebring. It was just unbelievable. That was a million tire, dollars the, well spent, the tire wasn't difference it? Was phenomenal. And they, I believe they're still on Michelin. Did the Goodyear rep ever get drunk and call Pratt and Miller late at night crying like, are you still thinking I feel, about me? Uh, the, the Goodyear <laughs> guys were super nice, and I think they knew that they were totally outmatched by the stuff that was coming out of Michelin for oh, endurance sports cars. Yeah. So, And it was so amazing to be on Michelin's in that season. It was so good. That's so, awesome. Wow, yeah. A second. Yeah. Zach, how's the uh, Patreon status? Do we have a bunch? We have yeah, like seven. Great. Yeah. We got a few questions on our Patreon okay. for uh, Riley. Uh, of course, if you want to ask questions uh, to the show, you must be a patron at patreon.com slash the Smoking Tire Podcast. You can get an ad free listening experience. You can get the show same day it's recorded, not wait till Tuesday, Thursday. And of course, you can ask the questions. Uh, John, John, John T. F. Man, John T. F. Man. John T. F. Man, mm -hmm. uh, Riley, what are the most enviable positions you've run across in the automotive industry, i.e. most fun and best compensation? What's the best industry job you've run across? That's mm. a great question. Um, I think it used to be running a car company. Um, but it, Like Bob Lutz yeah, era like, running like a car exactly, company? Exactly, like old school running a car company. But the, I think today is a really, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think that the maybe the de the delivery pieces and the growth of delivery and how much consumers want to get stuff delivered to them is a really fascinating piece which also has so many like policy problems but there's a ton of money in it that's very fascinating to me um, in automotive specifically I think it's hard to beat those people who work at like the proving grounds and all they're doing all day is just testing just prototypes hammering on cars and of different types and their fluency with tires and product is so probably how you guys are where you drive so many things that you, you don't need that much time in the next one to understand exactly what you like or yeah. dislike. And so I think if you did that and you were in the black forest of Germany mm -hmm. working at, you know, yeah, yeah. you were just like that. The Nürburgring test team, like the GM Nürburgring yeah, test any, team any, or Porsche Nürburgring you're, test you're team. probably yeah. well paid. You have great life insurance. And <laughs> yeah. that to me sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, that's I'm not probably that a good, good of a driver, but that sounds yeah. like Ch fun. Chassis engineer for the performance division of a car and company. That's yeah, a like good place Pr to Pruniger, be. Pruniger, like that guy. Yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah. That sort of his team. Yeah, yeah. Was, you know? Pruniger has the best job in cars. Yeah, like yeah. somebody who <laughs> carries Probably, his bags yeah. but gets to hammer on cars. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A lot of fun. The guys, uh, the guys I've met from from Ford Performance and GM Performance and SRT, they all seem to really enjoy what they do. I agree. They don't That's have right. a lot of yeah. complaints. Yeah. Although I, I ran into one guy at Ford's Romeo Proving Grounds, and I've told this a few times, but he seemed on the surface like he had a great job. At, but when I really thought about it, it seemed like maybe not so much. In what way? This guy's job, at least for this week, was to do 500 consecutive drag launches a day <laughs> in the GT500. It's like working at ice cream until shop, he right? Until yeah. he blew the clutch <laughs> or the like, gearbox. Yeah. And I was like, actually, that sounds terrible. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, my legs would be so oh tired. My God. I mean, you've seen the testing where they have to drive the truck over like concrete blocks yeah. to test the dirt. I mean, sure. and someone yeah. has to operate that vehicle. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. 
That's funny. <laughs> but the chassis dynamic stuff. What's the guy's name that ran that runs Detroit Speed or used to? Oh, Kyle Tucker. Kyle Tucker. Yeah. Like, he worked at GM during like the C6 development. So he got a, an amazing knowledge of driving and then how to like change chassis pickup points to make cars handle great. And mm-hmm. then he went and turned that into like an amazing cool. hot rod business. Yeah. So like their understanding sure. of vehicle that di- dynamics is amazing. The but, other the other answer I would give is so this year my friend Jared Holderbrand is running an Indy car at Pikes Peak. He's running at the Indy five hundred. He's gonna do a couple other unannounced projects. So just the variety of getting cars is kind yeah. of reminiscent of what, you know, like Parnelli Jones used to mm-hmm. do 40 years ago where you'd be in like you'd race four different types of cars and right. it sounds like if you're a racing cool. driver that has like the ability to talk setup and like an on camera personality and the ability to write a column that's the world useful. is your fucking oyster <laughs> yeah Zach and I are yeah. going to Pikes Peak this year we just I'm booked too. our tickets I'm you too. are too yeah, I'm going, yeah. what are I'm you do, what are you doing there I'm going to have just to hang out watch yeah. Pikes Peak oh that's cool all I'm doing so yeah I'll tag along if we're you just know. going to hang oh, out yeah, we're going to grill meat on the side of the fucking mountain that sounds great all right yeah that's all we're doing late breakfast for everybody yeah Perfect. Uh, Jordan Klein says, setting aside the hidden environmental costs of mining, manufacturing, and shipping EVs, I still see them as disposable items with a three-year shelf life. Uh, For that reason, I'm only comfortable with an EV lease. What advancements in EV tech should I be looking for that would indicate I can start considering an EV purchase? Interesting question. That is a great question. Um, And I think that's I would not recommend many people buy an EV for the long term. For the the typical car owner in America that wants to keep something for 12 years, I wouldn't be doing that with an EV today. Um, Unless the only way you could maybe do that is buy a three-year-old off-lease vehicle, but there aren't actually that many – there aren't that many great options outside of Tesla that you could find a used three-year-old EV. So I think that's a tough question. I would lease. And um, I think we're going to get to the point where battery swapping, not to for fueling purposes, but for replacement, will be a mm-hmm. lot easier. And when we get to that point, which is probably five or ten years away, then purchasing will be will make a lot more sense. I'm so. interested to see what the residual value looks like when my Mach E lease comes up. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's obviously a residual value on the contract, but I'm interested right. to see what the market is. You know, sure. do I just hand it back? Do I buy it out and flip yeah. it? Do I sit on it for a while? Right. I'm interested to see what happens with that. It'll be a yeah. We'll, we'll let you know in uh, April of 2024. Yeah, the in certain parts of the world, recycling a battery or reusing it is sometimes more or less expensive. So like an i3 battery in certain parts of Europe, you're better off recycling it than simply reusing it. Like breaking it down to its components mm-hmm. and then materials, metals people are spelunking inside there yeah. to try to pull stuff out. That's a place people are putting a lot of money, right? Trying to figure that out. So the that recycling, yeah, yeah that, that industry is pretty amazing and is so new that some of the recyclers have really just become suppliers for parts. So there's a company called Redwood Materials, which was started by J.B. Straubel, one of the Oh, I know. Tesla yeah, the Tesla guys. Yeah, he yeah. was the CTO of Tesla for a yeah. long time. And really what that company became is really a supplier of cathodes for other batteries down the line. The, the recycling part was really the step one to then get access to the stuff. Mm. So that'll be well built out, but it's not today. Mm. So at least I just saw I read an interesting article about a guy like a very young guy, 22 or something, who was using uh, takeout batteries from crashed Model right. Threes or whatever. Mm-hmm. And even though they might have lost 20 percent of their overall you know range or uh, life, right? Yeah. Um, he was using them as like storage, you know, batteries, grid, grid storage, grid storage yeah. for. RVs sure. and stuff, shit like yeah. that, it like out at like Slab City and yep. like yeah. and like that's definitely becoming a thing because yeah. a lot of the the wrecked EVs actually do have a pretty good pack inside. Yeah, uh, that's pretty hard to assess, but if you can do that, you can use it for grid storage because yeah. they're incredibly huge, well built. Yeah, automotive. And if you're not stuff. actually moving a four thousand pound car down the yeah. road, there's a lot of juice in there to to, yeah. to to run your whatever. Right. It'll be interesting when that world gets good enough where buying a used pack can be used by like a hot rodder. So I, I think back to like one of the first videos I ever watched that I felt like I became a fan of your stuff was the zero fucks given. Oh uh, yeah, Corbin's. Car. Yeah. yeah. And it'd be interesting, like what's the point where there's so much of that, like excess capacity of those parts where that dude goes in mm-hmm. and builds the next 
even fewer fucks given. EV. Well, there's there's shit like that out there now. For yeah, sure. For you sure. ever see the Teslanda? Yeah, of <laughs> yeah. yeah, that thing rules. Yeah. <laughs> but I want more of that. Like, yeah. yeah, culture. It's still really world. like the. I filmed this guy. He built a Tesla sand truck, which is like a buggy, but he put Tesla parts in it, Tesla batteries, and now he built I a four a twin motor Cobra. So like he took a Shelby Cobra kit, mm-hmm. and now it's electric, all wheel drive. Oh really? But when I watch what he does, it's like. He had to build the first thing to build this thing. It's yeah, a very right. uh, difficult, I think, um, skill set that he's had to learn sure. and teach himself versus Corbin just going and grabbing a bunch of parts from the junkyard. Yeah. But it, it it seems like we'll eventually head there. You just need these people to start the trend. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sean Gallagher says, Riley, you're smart. <laughs> Who do you think is the Ford Motor Company of the 21st century with regards to revolutionizing transportation and production in EV or autonomous driving? I think you, I mean, I would say you have to say that Tesla is out of the moment, that for electric vehicles, there's probably Tesla and everybody else at the moment. Even the even the other companies that are doing a, a pretty decent job of catching up. Um, I don't believe that Tesla has a permanent, you know, sort of grab over that position. Like, there's nothing, like I think we were talking about the 20-year kind of delay with other companies. Um probably making just as good of a vehicle and just as good of a charging network. So and it's not like Tesla has like exceptional manufacturing capability. Their cars right. are made only okay. Well, I think some of the other things around the car are a lot better than what everybody else does who is just focused on the core product, the really the sheet metal and the powertrains. Um, so for the it was the question this the I, I don't know if the century? question if, if the if, if Basically, who is the game changer, yeah. which I think, I think you did gotta, answer. It's got to be Tesla right now, and we'll see what the rest of the century holds. Mm-hmm. So, um, Have you driven pretty much all, all available EVs on the market? I haven't driven Almost. the... Um, I haven't driven the Taycan. Oh, I, I recommend it. Yeah, I've, uh, that's they fucking the, rip. <laughs> that's the only one, the only like major one that I haven't driven. Yeah. Probably some... Some Kia, I haven't driven it, but that new EV6 thing I just I, saw I really the commercial wanted, for it. Looks, really it looks that. cool. Yeah, I mean those nice cars look like car. Audis basically yeah. because of Peter Schreier and a lot of people who work in design of those. Uh, what's the Hyundai the Hyundai Ionic Five? That thing looks great. It looks they're, they're a very beautiful. cool looking car. They're beautiful. Yeah, yeah. they're they're doing a great job. Yeah. Um, there's gonna, when I when it comes time to get the next one. I, I mean I've, I'm a fan of my Ford, but when it comes time to get the next one, there'll be yeah. many more things to choose from. Uh, Mike Manillo says, "How far off do you think we are?" Uh, from EVs getting down to similar weight to their internal combustion counterparts, will we ever see a sub 3,500 pound EV sports car? I really hope so because the weight, I mean, growing up, I really just was a car enthusiast and I didn't think about things other than cars until I was probably in my late 20s. Um, and low mass is its own reward, right? Yeah. So most of the EVs are sort of important because they're pushing the world in a positive direction but the way they're doing it is you know with really expensive or really heavy cars I should say and they're expensive isn't it kind of uh, some Jack Baruth uh, wrote this for Haggerty but are we do you agree that we are kind of at the at a, at a, at a junction with EVs where okay now now 10 different 12 different manufacturers are selling a production EV all with very similar lithium ion battery packs they're heavy yep. uh, they're made of smaller cells but in order to get to that next level we're sort of at a what jack called a quote magic happens here moment where we we what we really need is an entirely new type of battery that can charge really fast that weighs a lot less and or takes up Maybe. less space and that no one's really cracked that yet i mean I think the the cultural problem is that the U.S. has has made people believe that we need a big battery pack, and part of this is going back to our discussion about how poor the infrastructure is. So mm-hmm. you really can't sell, you know, like remember the original like Nissan Leafs that had yeah. eighty three mile range. Right. I don't remember what the size of the pack was, but maybe like forty kilowatt hours, something th- th- something like that. Um, and America, the American consumer has mostly decided they need two hundred fifty miles or more. Otherwise, it's kind of not acceptable. 24 kilowatt hour was the original pack. Was it really? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so this is all to say, in the US, it's really difficult to sell small pack cars. Um, part of it is just the belief, the sort of American 
you know, belief that you need to have more than you need. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you, you need to contain in the vehicle more at the moment than you would ever actually use. Uh, but I think that we need a product that is basically uh, not a great answer to every automotive solution, but is a f- really fun, lightweight EV. So, like, my belief is if Colin Chapman was alive today, he'd be building really lightweight EVs with tiny battery packs, which would be a super annoying because you have to charge them all the time. <laughs> yeah. But you get these other benefits of like, oh, but I don't have to do these other things and it's lightweight. And so we don't yet have one of those products. Mm-hmm. So the manufacturers are all going to build heavy EVs for the next 10 years. They're going to be crossovers and SUVs. But there's probably a new product, which is not a new Mustang or a new 911. It's a it's a totally new thing formed out of a brand new idea. Might be a motorcycle. It might be a motorcycle. I would suggest it's probably an automobile, though, that's just small. It could even be a, a single-seater. And it's super lightweight, and it's got a smaller pack, and it's not great for getting groceries. But that's the point, is that this is just to prove that you can make a low-mass, high-performance EV. And no one's done it yet. Um, if I was running a car company and I had 10,000 you know, product engineers at Proving Ground, I would be like, you guys have to skunk work, something like this. It would be mm. so much fun. It would be interesting, I think. One of the problems I've had with riding e- electric motorcycles is that you ca- as they are, they're fun as fuck. They really are. Mm-hmm. Like the, the, it, it works. It works really well. I mean, it's, yeah. it, I rode the live wire and it feels mm-hmm. like flying a glider. Yeah. Uh, it's just amazing. It's totally unique and yeah. really, really cool. And it doesn't take away sure. anything from the fun of being on a motorcycle, in my right. opinion. But I really had to ride from station to station to station because real yeah. world was like 70 miles range. And, and you know, the, uh, the it's not everybody's problem, but it was my problem, which is that to go to where the fun roads were, it's far. <laughs> it was far. It was just yeah. far enough where right. it was like yeah. all I could do was That's go there and come back. Yeah, um, it's almost like scooter range, kind like of a, like a moped. Range, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I, I, I agree with you. I, I love if someone tried it and yeah, and just uh, small, lightweight. Yeah. Yeah. This is an interesting question, uh, traffic-related question, mm-hmm. and I, I think I have an answer to this one, but uh, I would like to see what Riley says. Uh, Riley, do you see Elon's multi-level underground tunnels gaining traction as a viable solution to increasing two-dimensional gridlock over the next 20 years? No. I No. Hard <laughs> fucking no. It's a hard no. I read a great book that's just called Traffic. I believe mm-hmm. it's by Thomas Vandenbrink. That, yeah, this is a, does that this sound is right? The, this is the book that Alex Troy always... And a second drink. It's a great a, fucking drink, book. Recommend this. Yeah. Great book. It's yeah. it's slight. Is it Vandenbring? Tom Vanderbilt. Excuse yeah, me. Vanderbilt. It's very slightly outdated because it's from like 2005. Yeah. And uh, Waze and other real time traffic sure. uh, software has kind of answered some of the questions sure. that it asked, but it basically explains in great detail that simply adding lanes yeah. in any dimension is not a solution. It's, of course. Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah, I don't think that underground tunnels are going to solve car traffic issues. Subways right? could. Proper subways. Yeah. Mass Sure. Mass if you transit. just think about underground tunnels as being um, spaces for trains, then sure. But just putting yeah. more cars in there. Yeah. That doesn't work. Uh, Joshua says, Joshua Lamson, uh, you brought up that the ideal city would have AVs going from person to person, chaining trips instead of being parked and taking up room. Wouldn't better public transit solve these problems in a much easier way than trying to have single person cars driving around still filling up the roadways? It's definitely, definitely true. The issue is in a lot of large American cities, the cost of train of station development um, because of NIMBYs and, you know, a lot of like in New York City, they've had this problem. In San Francisco, they've had this problem. You don't. I don't want a station in my neighborhood. Um, so, station-based development for all these other like transit-oriented develop, development um, is a fascinating idea. Unfortunately, that in the U.S., this is a really difficult thing. So, if you had the ability to put stations wherever you want, and you had the ability to put more um, budget into transit, then that would be a great solution. But I just I'm more of a pessimist. I don't. Is think that an, is there an advantage that New York has over San Francisco? Because I don't think we like to put things underground in in California because of earthquakes. But neither, you know, neither is New York, frankly. Oh. I mean, if you just look at the development of the um, what is the new is the, the second two, avenue, the second yeah. avenue line. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean that's how many over a decade. In the I mean, yeah, yeah. It's expensive, but at least you can kind of hide the station underground. You know, a little bit it, versus. Sadly, that still doesn't like. Mm-hmm prevent you from getting arguments from people in those areas that they don't want a station. Got I mean, it. a lot of the reason why Second Avenue needs a 
line is because it was designed not to have lines so people could live further away from the stations because they wanted to NIMBY themselves in a corridor of the city where they wouldn't be close to those stations. Mm. And so there's a huge amount of, there's a really interesting discussion about the benefits you get from transit um, and convincing a lot of people, unfortunately, who just are probably older and don't see a lot of those benefits um, in very wealthy enclaves within San Francisco and New York. Now, the goal, of course, is that younger people, when they get in the position of having an expensive New York apartment 50 years from now, will see the benefit of that. So I think it will probably change. But um, it's just really hard for us to agree to stations and therefore transit, which would make this a great answer. Yeah. So A lot of our, like... Like L.A., it's it's they they have built some some. I mean, right. first off, we had streetcars. Yes, yes. <laughs> fucking yep. the the there was a whole thing about why mm-hmm. we don't anymore involving yep. GM and Firestone allegedly, and, yeah. and yeah. Uh, allegedly mm-hmm. uh, etc. Mm-hmm. Um, and and now they've gone back to building some. We've got the the one. Mm-hmm. What's it called? The fucking line that goes metro. from the metro. The metro just called the metro. Yep, goes um, to the beach, right? They're building the or one we'll at to LAX the... right now. It does. Mm-hmm. No, it goes to Santa Monica mm-hmm. from Santa Monica to downtown. Yep. Uh, they've got the one they're building from LAX right now mm-hmm. to reduce car congestion at sure. LAX, and yep. it'll probably actually work. Yeah. Um, but it's. It's time consuming, resource consuming, space consuming. The NIMBY thing, especially in Los Angeles, is very real. Yeah. Um, and I think that what you were talking about, the autonomous cars, is sort of what to how to work in our existing infrastructure. Perhaps. I mean, Perhaps. I wish that our I wish that we had the type of transit and civil development that we used to have, mm-hmm. where we would have these massive projects that led the world and engineering and vision and new deal we just don't we don't have that sort of stuff anymore you have to go to other places for that Mm -hmm. so uh randy says i recently visited a local auto show and saw a mercedes eqs with rear bumperettes and saw some suvs with no apparent rear bumpers at all are compliance bumpers returning to the u.s market that's i think that's more of a you question i don't uh i mean i know that certain cars um Aston Martin's the the V8 Vantage has ugly little bumperettes. Hmm. Specifically, the the, have, the most egregious one I've seen is the Chiron. The Bugatti Chiron I, I remember looking US the on that. spec has the ugliest really rear nipples. Yeah, here we go. Oh Compa- my, that's production. Look at this. This is for, yeah, fucking production. And I I wouldn't be shocked to find out that most owners that's have them removed. But they are. And shockingly for, heinous. Only in the U.S. you have that. That's a rear impact bumper. Yeah, yeah that's a rear impact bumper. That's remarkable. And in Europe, uh, they do not. And the one on the on the, it looks like it's been taken off. On yeah, the, there's the blue one right there. Yeah. That one, yeah. Obviously see there removed. now it's been removed. Yeah. <laughs> and it's got a Bugatti of Beverly Hills that's, license plate yeah. frame on it, <laughs> yeah. so it's, it's like here. They probably did it for him. Yeah. yeah, yeah. My Countach came with ugly U.S. bumpers on it, and we took yeah. them off. And the rear bumpers hanging on my wall at my house. Really? Yeah, the ugly U.S. You bumper. could probably sell that on BAT for twenty grand. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Except nobody wants it. That's they all want to yeah. take them yeah. off. Uh, and the V8 Vantage does too. I don't know. I have. I don't know about the. Um, about the EQS, the ones uh, the ones I've seen, I haven't noticed. Can you can you see a Mercedes EQS rear bumper, Zach? Let's see about that. What does that look like? Uh, is there a bumperette? What's that? What's that one there? Review uh, Motor Authority, the the red one, second from the left. Is there are there bumperettes there? No. Well, there's some ugly little nipples surrounding the license plate in the back, and then how about yeah. the uh, how about the press photo there of the gray on the left, with the back. Is, are they in the press photo there? They don't exist. Hmm. Yeah, there. So the, European car. so the European yeah. cars yeah. Uh, do not have them, and it's the pretty, U.S. cars it's more subtle and hidden on this car for sure. Yeah, they're not as the they're block. not as big. Yeah, right. they're not like cancerous tumors. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> but they it are. It looks like really <laughs> big license plate light fixtures. Yeah. Now that, that I see them, yeah. I can't unsee them though. <laughs> yeah. They're not good. Yeah. Uh, well, Riley, this was a very this interesting conversation. Yep. Thank you so fun. much Absolutely. for joining us. These, Thanks, these are guys. really important issues, and, and yeah. I'm glad that you're able to come uh, talk to us about it. Uh, definitely follow, uh, is this uh, Riley Brennan, R-E-I-L-L-Y-B-R-E-N-N yep. yep. on uh, Twitter? Yep. Uh, you've got your newsletter, which you can uh, link to sure. uh, right there, which is, uh, founder, is very, very good. Yeah, if you're a founder, go to trucks.vc, um, yeah. the fund that I started with my partners, Jeff and Kate. Um, years ago, and you know, we basically write a first check to founders who are trying to change transportation for the better. So, 
Thanks very much, guys. And we'll see you at Pike's Peak in June. Yeah, Yeah. thanks for coming. That's our show. We'll be back uh, tomorrow with uh, Jason Torchinsky and David Tracy with their new project, The Autopian, uh, possibly also with Bo Bachman. We don't know if if Bo's coming or not, but he might, and that'll be fun. Uh, Thank you for uh, all of our patrons for asking questions, and we'll see you tomorrow.